chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy and strife and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? Paul loves this church. He's going to be a year and a half in this place with these people, loving on them, sharing with them. But he loves them enough to be straight with them. And I like that, you know. Sometimes it's very hard to be honest. You know, it's like, oh, no, you're doing fine. And you want to pat people on the back when, when you see that they're not actually doing all that fine. So, you know, last week in chapter 2, <clears throat> Paul had to divided the world into two categories, you know, the natural man and the spiritual man, the saved and the unsaved. And he says that the natural man does not discern the things of the kingdom of God because they're spiritually discerned. They're spiritually picked up. You, you have to have those spiritual senses to be able to grab hold of them. And all that the natural man knows is what his five senses bring in, you know, touch, feel, taste, you know, all of that stuff. And uh, that's how we've learned everything up to the point that we got saved. Everything came through the five senses. But since you've been saved, now you're equipped with other senses other discernment is available to you so the spiritual man now discerns perceives all things it's it's a very interesting thing that he does there he's been given the ability through the spirit of god to see beyond his five senses we speak of heaven and of angels we, we speak of christ's second return we speak of things that are very real to us, but are not real to this world. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> your friends and your family, sometimes they'll hear you go off on some supernatural plane, you know. And you're out there talking about the rapture, and you can't wait for it to happen. The trumpet's going to blow, and the dead in Christ are going to rise up. And then, you know, we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together, ever to be with the Lord. And they're looking at you like she has lost it now. Man, she's been to that place with that crazy bird on the wall. It's not even a real church. It's in a strip mall. And they're... They're filling their brain full of this wishy-washy, where do they get this stuff, you know? And uh, <clears throat> we're to taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's not with your tongue, you know? That's not with these eyes. We're to lay hold of the promises of God, but not with your hand. You can't, you can't grab that, you know? We're to behold him, but not with the human eye. We're to hear what the Spirit says to the, to the church, but not with these. It, it's so interesting to me what Paul brings us into. He's, he's awakening us to this idea that we've been gifted some gifts that we have to start to use and start to enjoy and start to practice with. <clears throat> so Paul divides the world. He says there are those with these spiritual gifts, spiritually born again people. They've got these new senses to pick up things that God is doing in their life. And then there's the unsaved. And he divides them, saved and unsaved. And then he takes the saved ones and he's going to divide them between spiritual and carnal. You have spiritual believers and you have carnal believers. You have mature and you have immature, if you will. And, you know, inside the church, 
among believers, there are these issues. You're going to run across babes in Christ. You're going to run across new believers. You're going to run across people that are just flat immature in Christ. And then you're going to run across, you know, good, healthy Christians, good, healthy, spiritual Christians. And, you know, you got to think about this. The Corinthians were saved, right? I mean, he's writing to the church at Corinth. He's writing to these people that are saved. They've been washed in the blood. They have the gifts of the Spirit at work in them. They have the mind of Christ available to them. <laughs> and it's the same as it is today in the church. But there are some in this church that are getting drunk at the communion table. That seems a little crazy, doesn't it? There are people in this church that are suing one another, taking him to court. You cheated me out of that $5 and I'm going to get it, you know? We look at the Corinthian church and we see a maturity problem. We don't see a not believer problem. There are several perspectives about this today in the church. There is a very legalistic perspective <clears throat> that says if you're a carnal, if, if some of the world still has a hold of you, well then you're not saved at all. If you're a Christian and, and you still drink alcoholic stuff, you know. If, if you play poker, on Friday nights. If you've been known to go to Vegas, you sinners. There is a very legalistic part of the church that says if there is anything worldly that remains in your life, you must not be saved. <laughs> and that is simply a lie. How do you know that, Mark? What do you mean? Well, you know, Paul's speaking about this kind of thing. Mature Christians, immature Christians, new believers, babes in Christ. He, he's going to bring up all of these things. But, but it's interesting because he's going to call these people brethren. He's going to call them, hey, you people that were born of the Spirit of God. And he's talking to this carnal Christians. You know, there's another view that says a, a carnal Christian is a baby Christian. They understand that they're saved. They know they, they should be in their Bible reading and stuff. And they know they're going to heaven. But they just don't understand the big issues. You know, total depravity. You, you wrapped your mind around that one lately, you know? They, they don't understand limited atonement. They don't understand... You know, the perseverance of the saints. They don't understand these deep things of God. You know, and that's what makes a true disciple. And again, that, that doesn't quite hit the mark of what Paul's trying to say here. These Corinthians were well taught. They weren't misled. You know, I, I read this thing on Facebook. <sighs> Beginning to hate Facebook. But anyway, I read this thing on Facebook about all of these carnal Christians out there in the world that aren't, haven't been taught well and they don't have the right gospel. They couldn't possibly have the right gospel and be doing what they're doing. And I just want to point them all back to, have you read the book of Corinthians? Because here is a carnal church and they had the world's best teacher, Paul the apostle, for a year and a half. I mean, I would love to sit under this guy for a year and a half. They had the best teaching, the right teaching, and they were still all messed up. Why? Because they hadn't matured. That's why. Paul is coming to a place that, that divides belief from behavior. That's what he's coming to. You know, the difference of knowing Jesus as your Savior and knowing Jesus as your Lord. I don't know if you've come to that place. There's a vast difference there. Oh, I'm saved! 
saved. That is so cool. I can do whatever I want to do, but I'm saved. I'm cool. And then you finally wake up and you realize, you know, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And, and you come to this place where you're like, oh, wait a minute. He's also supposed to be my Lord. What's that mean? He's the boss. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, You are our epistle written on our hearts, known and read by all men. You, you realize that <clears throat> people that are never going to read their Bible are going to read your life. They're going to watch you. They're going to pay attention to you. They're going to listen to what you have to say. <sighs> When you hear about all that junk in the church, you know, when you hear about all those, you know, Catholic priests and the little boy scandals, you know, when you, when you hear about pastors caught in adultery, when you hear about, you know, these church leaders ripping off whole churches and whole congregations for vast amounts of money and stuff, does that really bother you? Because I know it really bothers me. It's just got this thing to it. Because the whole world goes, yep, that's what pastors are. That's what the men of God are. They're all a bunch of phonies, you know. And that, that drives me crazy. Because everyone knows intuitively that your behavior should match your belief, right? If you're claiming to be a man of God, your behavior should be somewhat in that direction. Everybody knows that intuitively. You don't have to instruct people about that. You walk up to a four-year-old and go, there's a pastor. They expect something there. I used to walk out on the golf course, you know, and just get hooked up with another threesome and go, and, you know, two or three holes down the, down the fairway. Somebody would ask me, hey, Mark, what do you do? This is always fun. I'm a pastor. Suddenly they're walking over in the bushes to drink their beer, you know? And it just, it cracks me up. Your practice should accompany your profession. Yes, Jesus is our Savior, and that is a huge thing, right? But he's more than that. He is our Lord. If he is risen and alive and we are Christ followers, then there should be evidence of that in our lives. You know, you've heard it. I heard it my whole Christian life, right? If you were to be arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to put you away? <laughs> and that just that scares the heck out of me some days. I'm like, because, cause, you know, that Secret Service guy could be following me for a couple of days. Guy on a stakeout. He may not ever know I was a Christian. In Corinth, they were suing one another. Going, going to the world's court to do their bidding. They were involved in sexual sin. They were divided. They were getting drunk at the communion table of all places. Well, Mark, did they use real wine? Apparently, if they're getting drunk, it take a lot of grape juice, you know. <laughs> so there was a lot of carnality in the church, but notice how Paul addresses them in verse 1. And I, brethren. Don't you love that? Where does he place them? You are my equals. You're just like me. I could not speak to you as spiritual people, <clears throat> but as to carnal, as babes, where? In Christ. Oh, he has no doubt these people are saved. They're in Christ Jesus. I don't like that. Babes in Christ. That is not a new dating site, you know, for Christians. <sighs> Sorry, I just had to bring that up, you know. I was just thinking about that, you know. 
But as he brings this up, as he speaks to them as these equals, as these saved, born-again people, as he, as he does it, there's a brokenheartedness that he brings into the message. It's like a parent seeing a child not living up to their potential. I, I know none of you guys have had children like that. I may have had one. <laughs> <laughs> That's why my kids don't come here, you know. So. Paul had persecuted the church. He was a murderer. He he looks at this church and he knows they have every potential that he has. If they yield to the Holy Spirit. But that Spirit doesn't want anything to do with these carnal things they're involved in. You know, you ever, you ever go to the movie? And after you go to the movie, it's like, well, that went places I, ho I hoped it didn't go or hoped that would, you know. And you're walking away and you go, man, then you kind of realize, I took Jesus to that movie. You know. He was looking through my eyeballs as I was looking at that. He was hearing that with his ears as I was hearing that. And, you know, you just, you do those things and it's like, man, Jesus, sorry. So sorry. <coughs> so Paul challenges, he, he challenges us and he challenges them about being carnal in your behavior. Not their belief. Do you get that? Because they're they have this they have this separation, belief and behavior. We know that a lot of people do the same thing, you know. Their life isn't quite aligned with their, you know, confession. <laughs> it's walk the walk and maybe not quite or it's talk the talk and not quite walk the walk, you know, kind of thing. And we know that when we see that, it means problems. There's some issues going on. It's not quite the right lifestyle. It's never what you've stored up in your head. It's only what's trickled down that 18 inches to your heart when it begins to live out of here instead of out of here. I never understood that when I was a young Christian. I was stuffing all kinds of things in my head and it was coming right out of my mouth and it, 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 none of it had translated down to here yet, you know? And there's a, you know, there's a, there's a year, there's a couple of years gap. Well, for me, it was 20 year gap, you know? It was a, it was a gap. Paul does tell us there are such things as babes in Christ. This is simply young Christians. Any, anybody in here been saved less than a year? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my, my Lord. You mean there are babes in Christ in this place? There is nothing wrong to being an immature Christian when you're brand new, right? I mean, when I got saved, God just didn't go, well, here it is, with that, you know? And I, I had it all. I kind of wish he'd do that sometimes, but then I'm glad he doesn't. It's simply a young Christian. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, being new to the faith. When you talk to somebody and they say a few misguided things, it's like, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven and be an angel. You're like, whoa, wait, what, the, well, what are you talking about? We don't become angels in heaven. What? You know? And... You know, you hear, you hear weird stuff and you're like, well, that's cool, they're brand new. They don't understand yet. <laughs> when you get, get saved, you know, I didn't know the difference between an apostle and an epistle, you know. What? How do you spell that, you know? <laughs> the idea of worship was kind of mind-blowing to me. You know, I go into a Christian church there's electric guitars and drums and, you know, people kind of screaming on stage. And you're like, 
Can you do that? Is that okay? How about praying out loud? You know, you get in a small group Bible study and at the end, they all just start praying. The guy right next to me is praying. It's like, yeah, I hope it's not contagious. <laughs> Could get me. And it kind of drives you crazy. The idea of carrying your Bible to church every week. What? Doesn't have a handle. Well, at least mine didn't, you know. Well, and what's the deal with those red letters in there, you know? Said so like, you stop right there. Is it red? Stop. I don't know. <laughs> it's all kind of mind blowing when you when you just sit around and you think about it. What's going on? All of these changes are going on. Anyone have anyone here have kids? I know nobody does, right? Or grandkids? Oh Lord. <laughs> There's a time when immaturity is acceptable, you know. When you got that little year and a half old baby and, and they act totally immature, you can't, you can't do like, like people I've known. Why don't you act your age? I am acting my age, you know? I'm a year and a half. That's what year and a half do, you know? You bring those, you bring those babies home. So precious. It's so cute. And then they just scream. <laughs> You know, milk, anything, mom. I got a friend in Philadelphia, Joe, and he, uh, his second kid's boy, and she nursed until he was about three. It's cheaper than formula, you know, it's good stuff. And so the, the little boy would hear Joe around the house all day. Yo, Cass. Give me that. Yo, calf, do this. And so said they were sitting there in bed one night, laying there. It's all quiet. And out of the bedroom, you hear, yo, calf. <laughs> and this little three-year-old's yelling for Kathy to come in and take care of business, you know. And and Joe says, I'm just laying there, just shake the bed's just shaking, just laughing. And he looks over at Kath and he says, it's for you. I can't do nothing about that, you know. You know, all of those things are really acceptable for a little one, right? I mean, when you feed them and you pat them on the back, you're expecting that, that, you know. But, you know, when they're 15 sitting at your table, you're not really expecting. You're not really expecting that. <sighs> They're so cute, and they're so dependent on you. And that's all good for a time. Paul says in verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And that's acceptable. Notice that. Until now. That's cool. But even now you are still not able there's a time when it's acceptable just to give milk. When, it, when you're just a babe in Christ and you just need that pure milk of the word. <laughs> you know, babies can't handle the T-bone steak, you know. You're sitting there with dad, you cut off a piece and stuff it in their throat, you know. and Probably not going to work out good. So we breast, breastfeed them or we give them formula and, you know, we, we move them up to a sippy cup. Remember the experience. It's like, oh, look at that, they got the sippy cup on the back of the You know, half choking on it and stuff, but they're getting it in there. And man, what a, what a great progress you've made. Soon they want a spoon. And you know, you put that little plate of stuff in front of them, and next thing you know, there's nothing on the plate. But there's stuff on the floor, and the dog's eating, and it's all over their face, and it's in their ear, and it's everywhere. But you're excited because guess what? They're learning how to use a spoon and get it from here to there. It all happens naturally, right? There's this progress that you're expecting. You know, I remember Perry and RJ. Sorry, RJ. <laughs> They were two, three years old. 
And we lived in this house, and they were upstairs in their bedroom, and Brenda and I are like dead on the couch because it had been one of those days, you know, and hear this screaming going on. It's like, I am not going upstairs. They're going to fall asleep. It's over. I'm done. An hour later, there's still some screaming going on. I mean, it's screaming. And I'm ticked. Dude, this, is, this is BC for me, you know, before Christ. And I go storming up the stairs, and I knock the door open. And here's RJ, and we had these old double-hung windows, and we would always leave it open a little bit to get the fresh air in. And RJ was standing at the window with his hands on the window like this. So he's like looking outside. But the double-hung window had slammed shut. And his little fingers are in there. And they're now accordion shape, you know. <laughs> that feels really good about being a strict dad now, you know. <laughs> I feel like the biggest jerk in the world. Anybody ever been there, you know? <sighs> we go to the hospital. Oh, they're soft little bones. They'll straighten back out. Apparently, I don't know. <laughs> <sighs> Anyways, you grow up with them, and as they grow up, you expect maturity to come along. You expect change. A potty chair becomes a big deal, right? Because, you know, when they're sweet little babies, it's okay, but that, that runs old really fast. You know, like 10 days home, it's like, can't we just set them on the toilet and figure it out, you know? You don't mind changing a two-year-old's diaper, but you hate to change a 15-year-old's diaper. <sighs> when a child doesn't grow up or mature, you recognize, man, there's a problem there. So Paul understands that these, that there are babies in Christ, there are these young, brand new believers and it's natural and expected that there should be some immaturity with them. But we also expect them to grow, to mature, to take on some responsibilities. You know, they got to learn to self-feed. They, they got to learn to get that food from there to here. They, they got to learn to be in charge of their environment. Hey, you need to clean your room. You need to pick your toys up and put them away. You need to learn not to be so self-centered. What's the first words of a little kid when they get in a group of other kids? Mine! You know, it's mine! <laughs> well, good for you parents to train them that way, right? You got to go from being completely self-centered to becoming others-centered. That's just maturity. That's what happens through life. Hebrews chapter 5, Paul, I believe, Again, says this, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since we have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness." word of righteousness. Interesting, not just the word of God, but righteousness is behavior. It's taking that word of God and, and making it change your life, your, your, what you're doing, your walk and your talk. <sighs> but, for he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. When maturity comes, it's the idea of taking the Word of God and applying it to your life. And by reason of using it that way, it brings character and behavior under the Word of God. And that sensitizes them to know how to use good and evil, how to, how to grow, how to learn what is good and evil, how does it work, how do you implement it in your life. So, one of the first things I look for in a Christian, <clears throat> are they self-feeders? 
Are they taking the Word of God and feeding it to themselves? And I know, I've heard all the excuses, right? Well, Mark, uh, I don't read very good. Didn't ask if you read very good. Didn't ask if you eat very good. I just, are you eating? You know, because it's funny, I, I've been around people, well, I used to be one of these people. If I wore a yellow shirt and I went out to eat, the food would get on me. Because I, apparently I wasn't a good eater. And I wasn't a good reader when I got saved. But that didn't stop me. I knew it was important, so I started reading. Well, Mark, I don't really understand it, or, or I don't remember it. Yeah, I don't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday either, but it fed me yesterday. I don't care if you remember it. I care if you're putting it in. And put it in, and put it in, and put it in. <laughs> because if you're a self-feeder, it's a great sign that you're on your way to maturity. Because it's just like a little kid. As soon as they grab that fork and can get food from here to there, it's a great sign that they are on the grow. You know, they are on the move. I know some Christians... <clears throat> that are older than me in Christ. You know, I got saved 22 years ago. And I know some Christians who have been saved longer than that that have never read the Word of God cover to cover. Never. And I, I just struggle with that. I'm like, you're handicapping yourself. You're killing yourself. What do you even believe? How do you know you believe it? They know all the latest prophecy books and all the latest things that are going on in the, in the world and all the teachings of these wonderful leaders, but they haven't learned to pick up the Bible and just read it. And they are spiritually starving themselves to death. You know, I, I think it's interesting. Well, Mark, you know, I, I read... I pick up my Bible once or twice a week. You should try that with real food and tell me how you're doing. You know, you, you pick up real food once or twice a week, you can be one skinny guy. You see, I don't have that problem. I get this food blister on in front of me. I'm trying, I'm trying to get rid of it. But as we compare immature Christians... To baby Christians, there are things we don't want to see in, in Christians. You know, babies are self-centered. You ever had one? It's all about them, right? Feed me, change me, you comfort me, hold me, don't you lay me down, you know, entertain me, all of those things. You know, psychologi psychologists tell us that within 30 days, a baby knows how to cry how to get your attention for food, to be changed, to be picked up. Who's in control? Can I just ask you that? But it's not good when we find Christians like that, right? Babies are completely dependent on someone else. They can't do anything for themselves. Some people can't be alone with just Jesus and themselves. I, I don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't know what that's like. It's not good when you find, you know, a Christian that can't be alone with Jesus. I, I thought that was the whole idea. So we want to be alone with Jesus. But they need constant companionship, constant need of someone else, constant need of direction. They're an immature believer. Babies have short attention spans. Man, I could pick on you here, but I'm not going to. I think about Lily, my, my little granddaughter right now. And she'll start watching a movie and she'll sneak up on the TV and next thing you know, she's standing right in front of the TV and she's looking at it like this, you know. And I'm like, Lily, sit down. So she goes and sits down. Two or three minutes later, she's right back up at the TV. Lily, sit down. <sighs> Lily, I want you to go in and make your bed. And you know, she, she walks down the hall, turns the corner, and there's one of her toys laying on the floor. And next thing you know, she's supposed to play with the toys. Lily, it's been a half an hour. Did you make your bed? Whoop. 
here, play this, play with me, you know? <clears throat> Babies need to hold precedence over anything and everything else that's going on, right? They want to be the center of attention. <laughs> they are merciless when it comes to the matter of themselves. It doesn't matter if you've had a migraine all day. Juice. You know, it's a treat. Not right now. Juice. You know? <clears throat> doesn't matter if you haven't slept in a week. They don't care. Me. Me need this. Right now. And you know, you laugh about that at a three-year-old, right? <clears throat> you don't laugh about that when it's your 20-year-old doing that. You got to fix my car. You got to fix it right now. And let's get it done, you know? Because I got stuff I got to do. I got news for you. First thing you got to do is fix your car. <laughs> Suddenly it ain't my problem, it's your problem. Somewhere along that line, you know. But you hear them, right? <laughs> Cry! <laughs> I need! I gotta have! <laughs> You've been around some Christians like that. I'm sure you have. <laughs> Every time you're around them, you walk up very gingerly and you're like, how do I, how do I say hi? Because I don't want to say, how you doing? Because, you know, that could be a two-hour discussion. And I'm like, um, uh, mm, hey, Bill, you know, you're just out of there. <clears throat> Babies are ruled by their appetite. They only st understand their needs, their wants, their desires, their own little world. No matter how you try to talk to them about some other subject, it always comes around to what's going on in their life and what's happening with them. <clears throat> it's how they feel. It's how they see it. It's what's happening right here. You know, babies enjoy being the center of attention. They're only happy when they're telling you about what's going on in their life. Babies are demanding. And that's okay with a two-year-old. That's not okay with a 15-year-old. Nobody wants to be around a Christian like that. And that's what Paul's dealing with. He's got a whole church full of Christians like that. <laughs> Young babies are wonderful. We love them. Old babies are a nightmare. <laughs> he says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. Even now you still can't receive real meat, real word. And that is sad. Verse 3, for you, for, <clears throat> for you are still carnal, for where there are envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? <laughs> carnal. He uses the word carnal in verse 1, and it means fleshly, by birth, you know. We came out this way. But in verse 2, he, he says carnal because... We want to be that way. We're remaining that way. We're stuck in that way. I want to be this way. This is the way God made me. You ever, I've never heard that, but I've heard that, right? This is the way God made me, and he's just going to have to deal with me this way. Well, he will. He's a good father, man. He'll get out to whooping, strap, and whoop you, you know? <clears throat> He says, you have envy and strife and division. Doesn't that scream that you are carnal and behaving like mere men, like unsaved men, like unregenerate men, like unborn again men? Men just like the world produces. Not walking like men who belong to the Lord or have a loyalty to Jesus. He says, you're going to run across envy, you know. 
jealousy. You can't stand to see things go right for somebody else. How come I didn't get that? I've been struggling with this. I've been praying about this for like two hours. Now they get it. He says there's going to be strife, contention, quarreling. <laughs> Some Christians, if they can't fight, can't find a good fight, well, then they start one, right? I, I've been around a lot of people, and their favorite indoor sport is to play the devil's advocate. Yeah, but Mark, what about? And, and I got news for them. The devil doesn't have an advocate. We have an advocate. The devil's out there all alone. He doesn't need your help. And you're on the wrong team when you're playing the devil's advocate. You're supposed to be on Christ's side, not his side. There's going to be divisions, factions. You know, some Christians, <clears throat> they want us all to break up into certain groups. They want to divide us all into these places. They even have their own little heroes. I got a hero. My hero is so-and-so. And, you know, it's like, it's like they're a 10-year-old with a hero. You know, we're adults. I have people I really love, really admire, respect. But my hero is Jesus, you know. <laughs> if you're just going to pick one out, you know. <clears throat> they want us to split and divide when the Holy Spirit wants us to remain united in unity, grow in that way. It says in verse 4, for when you say, I am of Paul, <clears throat> and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? What are these special people to you, these heroes to you? Aren't they simply servants of Christ? I like it. Servants through whom you believed. Notice that. They were a tool to get you to belief. Not in whom you believed. I don't believe in my heroes, you know, these worldly guys. I believe in Christ through them. Your belief come th came through someone else. And that's awesome. As the Lord gave someone into your life, that strengthened you, that encouraged you, that drew you to Him. <laughs> we are simply instruments in Christ's hand, in God's hand to bring you to Christ. Notice verse 6. It says, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase. I think that's interesting because in, in verse 4, or in verse 5, it says the Lord gave Verse 6, it says God gave. Verse 7, it says God gives. In this whole scheme of things, we're just workers. We're just servants. You know, in farming, one guy plants, then they hire some guy and he comes along and waters, but only God brings that fruit out of the ground. Only God brings that increase. When you have surgery, you know, and week later you're feeling great the knees working again and you got all this stuff you don't go back to the hospital and say hey could i could i get get to that scalpula that scalpula scalpel yeah scapula and my, my wing hurts suddenly i don't anyway <clears throat> could i get to the scalpel because i want to worship the scalpel i want to oh what a great scalpel that was it was a tool in the surgeon's hand. And that's all we are. Maturity. One way to tell if you have maturity is by your diet. What are you feeding on? Is it the scripture? Or is it Harlequin romance novels? Is it Tom Clancy? Golf Digest? You know? Guns and ammo. Sorry, I see you back there. I had to pick on you. <laughs> Did 
didn't even have it written down here. It just came to my head, which is a miracle, I think. <laughs> Those who are immature are not handling the Word of God. Jesus, remember when he was tempted? He would said it over and over again. It is written. Thus it is written, you know. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <laughs> the greatest single thing you can do for yourself to bring maturity is to invest and ingest the word of God. <sighs> so the word of God can invest in you. It will be a constant light to your path. As you're walking along, thoughts will come into your mind. Scriptures will come into your mind. Pictures will come into your mind. Man, you, did, you kind of struck out with the wife this morning. You kind of blew it. Wonder what I should do. How should I be a better husband? And these thoughts would come to your mind. You should love her as Christ loved her. Give yourself to her, for her. Lay down your life. Enter her world and die there. You know, all of these thoughts come. Sometimes we don't like those thoughts. I'd rather be reading Gulf Digest right now. You know? <laughs> the Word of God was given once and for all, and it will never change. Because it's the perfect Word of God, and that Word of God is there to change us, to perfect us, to transform us. <laughs> so are you eating? Are you eating every day or is it just once a week? Well, I'm going to go to Smorgasburg this morning with Pastor Mark. We're going to eat all we can eat on Sunday morning. And then I got the rest of the week off. Man, you're a skinny guy, you know? When I come and I stand here, and I speak about all this stuff, I shouldn't be teaching you anything new. I should simply be confirming what you've been reading all week. That's what I should be doing. <sighs> Another sign of maturity, what's your relationship like with other believers? It's, it's an interesting thing. Well, they don't like me and nobody ever comes to talk to me and I don't think I'm going to go back there because that's just an unhappy place. You know? Maturity says, I'm going to go to church to bless somebody else, not to be blessed to myself. If that comes this way, cool. But I'm coming so the blessing goes there. Out. Because what am I? Oh, a servant of Christ. He wants me to look around and go, oh, that person needs prayer. This person needs love on. This person's going to have surgery. I guess I should pray for them. You ever just walk up to somebody and say, hey, how can I pray for you this week? Kids, remember, it's all about them, man, the bickering and fighting. You, you guys have had them in the back seat. He's touching me, he's touching me. You know? And then the one, you know, you, don't touch ever again. And then the one that can't be touched. Not touching you. You know? They bicker about the stupidest, littlest. I mean, they will fight over anything, right? And it's only because they're totally out of control because you're driving. And they know you can't just stop the car and get out and whoop them. They, my kids don't know that, but other kids may know that. <sighs> the one thing on this planet that is important to Jesus Christ is other people. Other people. End of story. It's not my, my old truck. It's not my house. It's not my car. It's not my bank account. It's not any of that other stuff. It's not even my job. It's other people. That's what's important. Because when all of this thing burns, oh, the only thing that's left is people. He came and died to purchase us and take us out of this world. And that brings him glory. So the only thing that matters to him is everybody else in your life. 
And what's your relationship like with those people, especially the people in this congregation right here? You know, I love being around new believers. I love it. It's just like being around a little baby. You know, I was holding one yesterday. It's about this big. He's like, man, forgot they were this big, you know. They are so excited about the things of Christ. They're reading in their Bibles and they're finding all kinds of things. Do you know that the heavens are going to roll up like a scroll? How do you think that's going to work? And I remember going through those questions. I remember reading that verse in Isaiah and just going, wow. I wonder if it's going to be like one of them roll up blinds. You know, you pull the little thing, you got to get it just right. And then, whing, you know, I always wondered about that. I'm still going to wonder until I see it happen, I guess. They're not mature. They're not boring like us, us that have been saved for 10, 15, 20 years, you know. We kind of kind of get a little mature, you know. Might be manure, but I'm not sure which it is. But th they're excited. They want to hear about Jesus. They want to hear you know, they want to become more discerning and they want to see what, what's that mean and how's that fit and what's going on there. And, and I love that. They have a million questions. They get so excited about worship and about prayer and about just these simple things, you know, because we're all sitting back there, not this song again, Ron. Oh, come on. <laughs> You're going to get those goosebumps again, you know. And we, we go through that being stupidly mature Christians, right? But the new believers, they're like, man, I love this song. I can't get enough of this. This is so cool. We get bored. Oh, not that passage again. Mark, I was here last time you went through this. Which one's pleasing to the Holy Spirit? Because there's a side. I want you guys to be mature Christians, right? But I want you to be mature Christians. Not mature like the world looks at us. Bored out of our minds. Oh, I've read that passage once. I think I got everything there was out of it. Isn't that funny? You know, I've been reading the Bible for 22 years. I sat down. The, the, the day after I got saved, I got home. I found my wife's grandmother's King James Version Bible, only one I could find. And I read it 10 chapters a day, and in three months I read it my first time, cover to cover. That'd be like impossible. You should not be able to read and do that. Because it was near impossible for me. But I did it. And I've been reading every day. I, I, I'm scared to say that. Because I may have missed a day or two. I've been reading every day for 22 years in that book. I've read it well over 25 times cover to cover. Well over. Some of those books I've read 50 times. And you know what? It's not boring to me. Every time I go through it, it's living and alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's dividing the soul and the spirit. It's dividing the soulish part of me, the natural man, and the spiritual man of me. <laughs> Every time I sit down and try to study, something jumps off the page and I'm like, I have never seen that before in my life. And you got to understand, I've been studying the Word of God and preaching the Word of God for 18 years. And I still find places that just go, I never saw that. Did they just write that in? What's going on? Is this still my Bible, you know? It's life changing for me. But most of us don't have an appetite for the Word of God. And I'll just give you John Corson's version of why that is. You know, John, he says, well, if you're busy, you know, it's like, it's like real life. You out there been working all day, you get the hunger thing going on, and it's like 4 o'clock. You're going to get off at 5, but you're driving by Burger King, and you know, the, like, Whopper, Whopper and fries. And so you whip in Burger King, and you get yourself a Whopper and fries and a softy, you know, frosty. 
and you go on and, and you get off at five and you go home and your wife's been slaving over a hot stove all day. And you're like, I'm not really hungry. You know, you got to have a no help you appetite, right? So you go up and you take the littlest piece there is and you take a little bit of this and you kind of, oh, that was really good, honey. And she's, you know, there's still a whole platter full of stuff on the, on the table and she's looking at you. She knows you've been cheating. <laughs> you see, with us, with us, we watch all the news, right? We're news hounds. So we're filling up with the news. What's going on around the world? What's happening there? What's going on there? So we fill up on the news, and then we got to get out our favorite stuff, our TV shows and our, our books and romance novels and all of this stuff, Tom Clancy, you know, and we fill up on Tom Clancy and all of this stuff. And by the time we get around to the Word of God, we're just not hungry anymore. We've satisfied ourselves. We've satisfied our soulish man with soul food. And we've forgotten, man, there's spiritual food out there. You see, it's our fault. It's so sad when the world fills us up with it instead of God filling us up with Him. We've been given the Holy Spirit of God. you got to think about that. We need to be careful not to grieve Him. We're going to get to this passage where it says, be careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Don't break His heart. Well, how am I going to break the heart of, of God? <laughs> well, if you come to church and it's lost its excitement, you're breaking God's heart. If you open His Word and you go, oh, here we go again. It's like I'm reading First Chronicles chapters 1 through 10 again. You know, it's just a list of names. How, what in the world could be buried in there? I have no idea. Maybe you'll be the one to discover it. You know? If the Word is boring to you, if worship is the same old thing, it means one thing. Your heart has wandered. And if I know anything about life, it's always a matter of the heart. It always comes down to what's the matter with your heart. Don't just be an old Christian. Because I know some old Christians. Become a mature Christian. Someone who's excited and alive and ready for God to do whatever it is He's going to do today. If you're a new believer, you start to go through those steps of becoming mature. And you remember what it was like for kids. It's going to be the same way for you. I got to feed myself. I got to take responsibility for my stuff. I need to clean up my own messes. I need to check. I need to stop being so selfish and become more others centered, others focused. You want to start becoming Christ's man or woman. Not your man or woman. <laughs> Are you praying that he would mature you? God, would you take this and show me what maturity looks like? Help me to get to that place. Lord, would you train me to be who you need me to be? Would you prepare me for tomorrow? Because I have no idea what tomorrow holds, but you do. So Lord, prepare me for whatever you got coming. I can't change the past, but I can restart today to become who he wants me to be. You know, as a 22-year-old pastor, Christian, teacher, I can just stand here and look all of you in the eye and go, I'm not who I should be. I'm not. I fall well short of who I want to be. But thank God I am not who I used to be. And there is a huge difference there. I am in progress, right? I am, I am in process. And I want that process to continue. And the best way I know for it to continue is for me to remain hungry and excited and alive and waiting for whatever it is he's got for me. So I press on to that high calling, right?
I press on to that calling that Christ has called upon me. And we should all just take note and go, Lord, where are you calling me? Prepare me for it. Let's go do that. Because that's your will. I want to be right in the center of your will. Lord, as we think about just these five simple verses about Christian maturity, about carnal believers and spiritual believers, about babes in Christ. Lord, it finds us all over the map. And Lord, I just I just want to lift us up as a as a unit and say, Lord, have mercy on us. Give us your grace, your peace. Lord, stir within us to eat your word regularly, to partake of it. Let it come inside of us and change us. Lord, that it wouldn't just be words on a page, but it would be instructions that we want to hear so that we can change who we are, so that we can walk before you in righteousness. Lord, we want it to be your word of righteousness. Your word that affects our behavior. Lord, if we're carnal, Lord, draw us, cleanse us, forgive us, start us on that new path. Lord, if we're a babe, Lord, walk us through those early steps. Lord, help us to just grow in you. And Lord, if we're old and mature and wise, and hardened in our ways. Lord, would you wake us up out of there. Shake all of that junk off of us that can be shaken. And then, Lord, revive us in your spirit and in your care. God, we pray that. We pray that your hand would be upon us this week. In Jesus' name, amen.